good afternoon. Um, well, I'm Joseph Matthew. I'm the chairman of the Aerospace Engineering Department here in ISC. Um, <clears throat> I welcome all of you to this lecture. This is the first, the inaugural lecture in uh, a series that we hope to hold throughout this year, uh, <clears throat> uh, once a month, on a variety of topics, uh, not specifically aerospace engineering. Um, <clears throat> Uh, and uh, we haven't, we don't have a full schedule yet, but we will uh, get this going shortly. Um, <clears throat> I'm very happy that Professor Nasima has uh, agreed to give this inaugural lecture, and that our director, uh, Professor Anira Kumar, has agreed to chair this lecture. Um, the uh, aerospace engineering department uh, is perhaps only one among many groups uh, and institutions uh, and individuals who are immensely happy and proud of their association with uh, Professor Satish Dhawan. <clears throat> we, uh, we will have, uh, and we have had occasion to recall his uh, contributions and perhaps more usefully uh, his ways, his distinctive ways um, in uh, different places. Uh, but uh, with this series, uh, we are less looking back and uh, more looking forward about uh, bringing in new areas. We want to provoke our colleagues and others who attend to venture into new areas. We, we have extracted this, let's say, as uh, one of the essential contributions that Professor Darwin did um, by opening up new areas in the Institute and new ways of doing things uh, wherever he went. <coughs> and I said uh, uh, we will consider different aspects, like today, for example, um, the cumulus cloud uh, and its dynamics, the phenomenon atmospheric dynamics, it's also a fundamental problem in fluid, fluid mechanics of turbulence. And it has important consequences for aviation, weather, and hazards. Um, so it spans different areas. And uh, as we see discernible effects of climate change, uh, there are perhaps new areas that we, many of us, need to be working in. So uh, with this, let me uh, request our director to come and chair the lecture. Good afternoon, everyone. It is my pleasant duty to chair the very first uh, lecture which, will, which is going to start a lecture series during the centenary year of the birth of, Prof of Professor Satish Dhawan. Um, I think there's no better person in this audience, uh, in this group here, who would know Professor Dhawan than the first speaker here, Professor uh, Narsimha himself. I personally uh, never worked with Professor Dhawan. I just happened to have had a fleeting glimpse of him very briefly, a little anecdote for me here. In 87, when I had come to do my interviews in IASC, I also interviewed an ISRO that year. And as I was exiting the building after my interview, I saw Professor Dhawan entering. Uh, he was a tall person with, in, in those days, very white hair. That's all I ever saw of him. I'm sure many of you have known him for a long time and have worked with him. I just want to say a few words to the young people here about the impact, impact that Professor Dhawan had on the Institute. Professor Dhawan became director of ISC at a very young age of, 40, of just 42. The youngest director, I understand, ever, and also the longest serving director of the Institute. During those 19 years that he was director here till 1981, he had major impact on the way this Institute, uh, what this Institute became during those 19 years. The Institute transformed in many ways, and it became a much more modern place compared to what it was when he took over. 
He had just come back from Caltech and he sort of had seen some of the best practices that uh, were, being, uh, were there in Caltech and he brought many of those best practices to ISC. In fact, he had seen the, the notion of divisions in, in, uh, in Caltech. He had seen, seen the notion of department chairs in Caltech. All of these were brought to ISC. So departments had department chairs rather than department heads. There could be many professors in a department. There were, uh, they, he put departments together into cohesive uh, divisions. Also during his time, several uh, departments uh, which you see today were launched, like computer science and automation, molecular biophysics, at the NMR Center, and many others. I just want to uh, give a quote uh, from Professor Yashpal, who was then chair of UGC, regarding the impact that Professor Dhawan had. Uh, Professor Dhawan's role in making the Indian Institute of Science a great center of learning and research has been seminal. It is during his time that ISC developed its unique personality and its breadth. Without his lateral vision of the institute, the institute would have been no more than an excellent institute of technology. He made it into a place that attracted talent far and wide, where people might have been recognized in terms of the departments to which they belonged, but boundaries were kept porous. I think this is a very unique thing about ISC these days, lots of departments with very porous boundaries. Even deep social concerns soaked in during his time. So with those few words, I will move on to introducing the speaker. I'm sure you will hear a lot more insightful comments about Professor Dhawan from Professor Narsimha himself. Uh, I have a few paragraphs on Professor Narsimha. I'm sure a lot more can be said about him, but I think uh, many of you already know his eminence. Professor Narsimha is an internationally known, uh, acclaimed researcher in fluid dynamics and, and an aerospace engineer. His scientific research works are mainly concerned with transition and turbulence and shear flows, Probably he'll talk about that in his lecture today. Atmospheric fluid dynamics in clouds and high-speed flows. He has also been closely associated with aerospace technology development at both technical and policy-making levels. Prior to JNCASR, where he is now, where he was the founding chair of the Engineering Mechanics Unit, he has held research and leadership positions at the Engineering Institute of Science, his faculty of aerospace engineering, dean of engineering, of engineering faculty, chair of aerospace engineering, and, and then founding convener of the Center of Atmospheric Sciences. He also became director of the CSI National Aeronautic Laboratories and the National Institute of Advanced Studies for a while after his retirement from ISC. He's been widely honored for his research and scientific leadership with fellowships of several international science and engineering academies, including the three academies of India, uh, the, Royal the Royal Society, the Royal Aeronautical Society, the American Institute of Astronautics and Aeronautics, the U.S. National Academy of Engineering, and the U.S. National Academy of Sciences. His awards include the AIAA Fluid Dynamics Prize, the Trieste Science Prize, and the Patna Vibhushan. He has been associated with Professor Satish Dhawan as a student, later as a colleague, collaborator, and a friend, and I think he is the best person today to speak uh, about Professor Dhawan and give the first lecture. May I welcome Professor Adam Narsimha. Professor Kumar, Director, Professor Bonham, Matthew Joseph, uh, Chairman of the Aerospace Engineering Department. Many of my friends here, I see uh, many people in the Aero Department in CAS, Professor Prabhu, Professor Bhatt. Uh, and friends. Well, I am greatly honored that I have been asked to speak something about Professor Satish Dhawan before I go on to the other thing, the more scientific uh, topic that um, I intend to cover later on. Um, but um, um, my memories of uh, Professor Dhawan are still pretty green because he made an enormous impact uh, on me and actually on the institute, partly because he was such a singular man. What I mean by that is that when I joined the institute, um, at that time we used to have a diploma course in these subjects, in these engineering subjects. I was later on converted to ME, uh, Master of Engineering. Um, when, I, when I joined the institute, 
The institute was a very formal place. Every faculty member came with a suit and tie. And usually the contacts between uh, the faculty and the students was not always, you know, not always very informal. Let me put it that way. So um, the number of research students was very small. And when I came, the head of the department was a German, Professor of Teachings, Prantl student, who, with his uh, advisor, wrote two books about um, aerodynamics and uh, hydrodynamics. Um, basically, really, as far as fluid dynamics is concerned, I think that uh, modern fluid dynamics started with Prantl uh, very early in the century, 1904. He solved the problem, resolved many paradoxes, but while it had a mathematical element, it was not done as a mathematician. It was done as an engineer, but presented in a conference of mathematicians. Because there was, there was in it a germ of an idea which later on became very well developed in a new mathematical method called massless asymptotic expansions. Well, the point I want to make is that uh, in this setup, in, in that atmosphere, when uh, Lavan came, he first came as a scientific officer <laughs> and uh, after a year or so, he became uh, an assistant professor a year or two years. And when I went there, he had just started work on the high speed aerodynamics lab. Well, um, he, was, he was a singularity on the campus for many reasons. First of all, he didn't dress like any of the other faculty. He came in very colorful shirts, and he was a very cheerful person. He had at that time, he was still a bachelor. He had a, an MG sports car, red one. And uh, when he came from uh, the place he had for his uh, residence, he would jump out of the car, run up the stairs in the old aero department, because uh, I mean now the aero department has moved, and run down the stairs on the other side, step into the classroom and say, good morning to you, or good afternoon to you, whatever it was, very cheerfully. So he was, a, he was a totally different uh, kind of person. So he, his impact on the students, and I think on the faculty, was extraordinary. He had, um, of course, he tested us every now and then. He had uh, some exams and uh, he taught us, wrote everything on the board. But quite apart from that, if anybody was interested in the subject, he was willing to talk to him. Um, personally, many times. So anyway, to, to cut a long story short, I uh, ended up at the end of the first year. We used to have a six year, six month thing outside. At the end of that time, um, we, had to go, we had to go to industry, which meant we went to HIL to do something. Well, we learned something, but we didn't learn as much as <laughs> we could have or should have. So Dhawan once said, Say, I'm going to build, I'm building a supersonic tunnel, can you help me? I said, I would love it. So in fact, I worked with him. There was a one inch by two inch supersonic tunnel, I'm just about ready to run. I calibrated it, and there was another one, five by seven, did that and so on. Once again, to cut a long story short, it was a pleasure to work with him. And I immediately saw that that's the kind of thing that I wanted to do too. I was also tell you that, uh, at the time when I joined aeronautics, it was a very unpopular course. <laughs> but I'd come as a mechanical engineer from the government college here, when the institute had an open day, and uh, they had a spitfire parked in the quadrangle, you know, where there's one of those trees. Under the tree was a spitfire spark. That was the first aircraft that I could go see, touch, and so on. And it had elliptic wings, I said, which seemed mathematical. But if they opened any of those, uh, um, what do we call them? The things that they had to close the, let the engine. It was just an enormously complex uh, thing. Everywhere there were tubes, pipes, corks, and valves, and so on. So it seemed to come up in mathematics with very complex technology. And I sort of made up my mind that's what I should do. But when I came to, <laughs> Aeronautics. Before I came to aeronautics, and I applied, and my father asked me, "Well, what do you want to do?" I said, "I want to do aeronautics." A friend of mine there. Why don't you go talk to him before you make up your mind? I came there. 
and I'm not joking. My father's friend said, don't be a fool. There are no opportunities in aeronautics. <laughs> you better do something else. Why don't you join the Indian Railway Services or even appear for the IAS exam? And when I went back and told my father, he said, so what do you want to do? No, I still want to do aeronautics. I said, then you go ahead, he said. So that's how it all started. Well, at the end of two years, we had a German professor at the time. He went back um, to Germany. He was a very nice man. He taught us like Prantl did. If he mentioned a professor, it always meant Prantl. Okay. As Prantl used to say, he would say. And he said, this is what Prantl actually did. So I was thinking about what I should do. And once again, it was Dhawan who asked me, what do you want to do? And I said, well, I'm not quite sure. I, I thought at that time I had two alternatives. One is to go join a jail, which I did not particularly like, or to go work for the med department, where I could at least see something about the air okay. Well, he said, why don't you do research here? Stay on and do some research here. I did. I said, I said, agreed. I was very happy. And that's how some of that work came up. We won that on, on transition that you mentioned. Well, anyway, I could go on like that. But I think that um, Professor Herman had an extraordinary impact on the department. Uh, he quickly became, after I left, he became a chairman of the department, head of the department. And when I came back in 62, he was already the director. And I still remember uh, seeing him, well, going there on my first day. He said, okay, I've come back. Uh, he was having a conversation on the telephone. And, uh, you know, in those days, you couldn't just uh, ring any time you liked. And uh, we were talking about something and it rang. And there was a voice from the outside. And he said, uh, basically what he said was this. Look, my colleagues don't like me very much because there was already a case against him. The courts here. That a very young man was being appointed the director. But uh, I really don't want this position. I didn't want to ask for it. So why don't you please appoint somebody else? I'm submitting my resignation. The voice from there basically said, no, you are not the person who is guilty of your appointment. I am. So I will take care of it and you don't have to worry about it. Why do you worry about it? You just carry on. He said. <laughs> and that turned out to be Baba, who was on the phone trying to console him. Well, I uh, suppose at that time, although he had left the department, he still had a couple of students. And by then also he was married and I got to know him in a different way and continued some of the work that we had started here when I was a student and did other things too. And so that is how, that is how it started. So let me now show you a, sorry. Well, that was uh, Dhawan at the Institute of Science in the early 50s. And this was taken at uh, Nandidur, if I believe it or not. He went on a, in the department, uh, or a group in the department, went on a hike up uh, the Nandi Hills. And here he was with us. And he's uh, sitting there on one of those little hillocks. That's what he looked like. And he, as I told you, he quite often wore colorful dresses. And here he was in the 1970s, when he was not only director of the Indian Institute of Science, as all of you will know, and he was also chairman of ISRO, the Indian Space Research Organization. And, uh, but that was once again typical of him. He's, he's uh, speaking in front somewhere, but you can see what it was like. Well then, when um, he retired from the Institute, and also um, from uh, ISRO, this was what Dhawan looked like. And by them, he was a wise engineer. So from a young scientist to a great leader and a wise engineer, he always had the interest of the nation in mind. Um, once again, you probably have heard these stories about him. He was, um, he was a man of great uh, moral integrity. And um, he was not actually Let's see, I, I just want to make sure that I'm not going to exceed my time. Yeah. Um, 
So if there was a new prime minister, he would go and say, well, here is my resignation. The prime minister said, no, no, I don't want you to go, you carry on. So he transformed during those years the Indian Institute of Science and also the Space Research Organization. But what was he? Was he a scientist or an engineer or an English scholar? That was his, that was his university education. He started with a BA in Physics and Mathematics, got a degree in English Literature, did a B honors in Mechanical Engineering, then he went to the United States. He had spent a year at HAL uh, getting some training. He got a master's degree at uh, the University of Minnesota. Then joined uh, Caltech, where he got a the Aero Engineer is a degree, kind of is the equivalent of a degree. It's like our uh, MSc by research at Caltech. And then he went on and got his uh, PhD. Well. Uh, his guru, his, uh, his, uh, uh, his advisor was uh, Hans Liebmann, Professor Hans Liebmann, who was actually a physicist by training, but uh, he was one of those people, and well, he was also an extraordinary man, he had a great sense of history, and uh, he was one of those people who got his uh, PhD just before the Second World War started. But by the events that had taken place in Germany, he was aware that, or he, was, he, was, he, he thought that uh, the war will start any time now. And uh, it is said that at the party that they had after his, when, he was, when he got the degree, people asked him what, what he was going to do. And then he said, I'll, I'll go out as early as possible. So his advisor uh, wrote to Caltech people, in particular Kuban Kaman, so he went to Caltech. The war, war started just a few months after he had reached. Caltech. And he was, uh, Dhawan and Liebman had extraordinary influence on each other. And uh, this is the part which not many people know, so I'm going to talk now about uh, uh, his work. When uh, Dhawan passed away, Liebman wrote this in his obituary. He recalled that he worked with two Indian graduate students, both I believe from upper crust wealthy backgrounds, with whom I could not work well. Why? Because uh, they didn't like to do anything manual. For example, he used to say that if the battery had to be moved from one place to another, they wouldn't do it. They would look for where the servant was, where the mechanic was. And uh, I was of course not stupid enough to consider this a general characteristic of Indians. But I felt that perhaps the select group that came to Caltech from India had prejudices against manual labor. That, that was a widespread feeling there on the campus at that time. But what I found, however, was that Dhaman was not like that at all. So he says this was a bifurcation point in his life. And one of these bifurcations resulted in my meeting such as Dhaman. Well, in uh, 2002, when um, he was my, my friend for more than half a century, his personality and friendship had an important lasting effect on me, but what is even more important, my understanding of India. See, till then, he had not met really Indians of this kind at all. He joined the research group. And uh, he clearly became an outstanding mem new member of that group. And uh, uh, he was immediately accepted and respected by this highly competent and proud group of young scientists. He had, well, um, those names are well known. Uh, there was uh, Julian Cole, there was Don Coles, and um, a variety of other people, uh, Anatole Roshko. And uh, he showed an unusual maturity in judging both scientific and human problems, a characteristic that today is called leadership quality. He recognized a leader in him very early, very early in his career. Well, they worked together, Leipman, Rashko, and uh, 
Satish Dhawan. They worked together on a problem in shockwave boundary layer interaction. That was the first really um, thorough study of what happens when a shockwave hits, let's say, on an aircraft wing, for example, hits the wing surface. And um, Satish's first participation in active research there, marvelous time. Almost everything we touched was new and exciting and laid the foundation for our lasting friendship over the next half century. In 64, he came here to this institute, this campus, and taught a course on stochastic processes uh, of all things. And I think there must be students here still who are there in that course. I think uh, Prabhu, you were there, you took that course, right? Yeah. So, uh, so he gave that course and uh, there were many students who took that course. And at that time, he brought his family with him uh, to the institute. It was certainly no accident that Bangalore was the only place for me to spend a term away from my many years at Caltech. He never went out to spend a term. He, he so enjoyed what he did here that uh, his memories were very strong. Now, this also has to do with the work that uh, Dhawan did in, um, when he was in Caltech. This is the shockwave boundary line interaction thing there. Um, well, there is the shockwave, and here is the surface where, where, where it hits it. And um, there, there is a boundary layer near the surface. The shockwave here, where the flow is virtually inviscid, is loss unknown, and all cannot be laid down. But what happens when it hits the surface was the, was the major question. So they measured the pressure distributions. Here they are, the world's first uh, measurements on such flows. And um, as you can see, this became uh, very widely known after that. And um, the, kind of, the kind of effect that it had on the boundary layer depended very much on whether it was laminar or turbulent. Uh, he also measured skin friction on the surface. At that time, the boundary layer was still, although widely accepted, had not really received the stamp of uh, um, uh, acceptance, wide acceptance. And so they decided that they would measure the skin friction directly, which was done by this instrument. There's a floating element there, and the flow is like this, and the stress applied on this element or on this plate makes it move and uh, that movement is restored by this transformer here, differential transformer. And the amount of movement that you have to make is a measure of this friction. So that was the principle behind it. And doing that, they did this. And as you can see, this appeared in a report by Dhawan, 1953. At those times, more information on aeronautics used to be contained in NACA reports than in uh, journals. So, uh, this, of course, immediately became very widely known and appeared in the books just, just even as soon as they were published. So you see the measurements agree completely with what the skin friction should be in laminar flow here and in the turbulent flow there. So when I first went to uh, the institute, here was the wind tunnel. And that wind tunnel was five, meters, five millimeters by five millimeters. And I think it is still there in the high-speed aer aer aerodynamics lab uh, in the new building. Uh, his idea was not enough to talk about shockwaves, but people should go, should be able to see, should be able to see how it's done and so on. So this was all done in a workshop there, where you had a very good mechanic. Uh, this five millimeter by five millimeter thing also had a um, setup for Schlieren measurements, and you can see a picture there. And the students felt much easier than they could actually see that. He was interested in bird flight. Here is one published by the Academy, uh, Indian Academy of Sciences. And that's also an interesting thing to read. This was where he um, did this, so to speak, for uh, relaxation. Here is, uh, here is the blackboard at the director's office. And you can see this, the kind of things that he had on the board. An aircraft wing, uh, 
she was calculating for something. There are these birds here. She was looking at bird wings here and uh, looking at the units. He was trying to convert bird performance units to aircraft performance units. And here is a small thing here. Space Commission, 2.30 p.m. That's when it's meeting. <laughs> There's all this with a little note and with that you should attend the Space Commission meeting. Yeah. So, uh, this, is, this is the final thing on the one that uh, Dietmann said. His unusual maturity in judging both scientific and human problems, and I already I think, mentioned this, was immediately accepted and respected by the group of young scientists they had in Liebmann's group and became the natural leader of the group. And uh, Liebmann was very good at judging people. 1962 was when I came back. Um, of course, most people thought there that uh, I wouldn't like India if I went back home. <laughs> I would immediately be back again. So they took bets on me. 1962 also was the year when India was fighting China. And we lost that uh, fight, as all of you know. Then uh, Liebman heard that the Chinese had actually made advances. He said to me, you know, if you had 10 dhavans in India, you should be able to solve all your problems. I mean, that, that was the appreciation that he had for his uh, leadership. This is his career, quickly going through. Assistant professor, professor and head director, visiting professor at Caltech for a year. And then he was invited when he was at Caltech to come here and become chairman of uh, the Indian Space Research Organization. Um, well, I can go on like this about his stories, but I think I should get back now to science. So, I was Secretary of the Department of Space and Chairman of the Space Commission. And then in 1981, when he retired, he still continued as senior advisor and a member of the Space Commission until 2001. Well, this was in, uh, we just had the 14th Asian Congress of Fluid Mechanics here in December. This was the first one. This was also held but in December 1980, however. Um, the first one, and uh, here are the people who, who the government had appointed as their um, representatives. Um, Dhawan, of course, here. Um, sorry. This is Professor Chow from China. It was not at all clear whether they would come or not. Uh, we had no reply from them. <laughs> the communication was not easy with the Chinese at that time. But three days before, there was a telegram saying that they were coming. So everybody was happy that they were there. Although the number of people was not large. That's Professor Sato from Japan, who was a friend of mine in Caltech and uh, JPL. And we used to meet each other. I used to go to Caltech now and then. And I once asked him, you know, how come we meet each other here, but not in Asia? So he said, yeah, you're right. So let's start an Asian Congress of Fluid Mechanics. So that's how it was started. And that was the governor at that time. Mr. Govind Narayan. But he also enjoyed the company of young people, had a great sense of humor, and here he is, I think, at a party in that Congress. Here is he is with a wife. Um, well, they were a very happy family, and I used to visit them now and then. So, he established research on boundary lines and turbulent flows in India. Highly regarded by his students and colleagues. He started, this is a very interesting thing, he started research on problems relevant to India that often went on to become scientific problems in their own right. When I started on transition, uh, what I was told was not so much that it's a very interesting problem, a scientific, important scientific problem, but you see, our wind tunnel here is not the right size because it's in the transitional range and if you have to give the correct results to the people who are designing this aircraft, we must know more about transition. That's how it started. Uh, he was ingenious in design. And the tunnels and various other things, he would make drawings, he would get them made. Meticulous in execution and cautious in interpretation in his experimental work. And he could combine little science, like these things that I mentioned, and big science and technology effectively. He transformed the Indian Institute of Science, as the director pointed out already. Courses, etc. 
departments, centers, new areas, uh, left his uh, imprint on every institution he worked in or led, led the National Space Program with extraordinary ability. And he was a person of great moral integrity and commitment to help solving societal problems, as much by personal effort as by science and technology. So that's what makes him, I think, a very unusual person. Well, I could go on like this about uh, Professor Dhawan, but let me come back to uh, the scientific subject of my talk. Let's say I'm actually, uh, so what? Okay. Well, I want to take over, talk about the work that we've been doing on the cumulus cloud, which goes back more than 20 years now, maybe 25 years ago that we started, and I'm still doing it. I'm still doing it because there seem, still seem to be many things which are left to be um, discovered or explained. I have two videos and would like to show you quickly what they are. Now let's see, what do I have to do now here to get the video going? Okay. You know the monsoon clouds around India, as you can see, running around with the wind, of course, fast motion. They look very fast, and you can see uh, variety of them coming from uh, different directions. Okay, so let me stop that and uh, go to the next one. This is in Arizona. Well, we were in the tropics there, now here we are on the desert. And uh, the clouds here are also very interesting, of a, but of a, of a totally different kind. You can see them, you can see these cumulus clouds there, how they are formed, and uh, how some of them are at low levels, and some of them will reach very high levels. And I think one of them, as you will see, really reaches quite large heights. It's an extraordinary kind of convection. It's clear that it comes from the convection from the hot, warm ground and uh, rises, look at that, that's, that's the kind of cumulus cloud that is the subject of my work, the last one that you saw, something which will rise more or less vertically um, and we are going to assume that it is axisymmetric just to get the principles right. They are of course not in reality completely axisymmetric. Well, clouds in Poetry that uh, well sung in most countries. I just quote you one from Kalidasa, where he is uh, talking, you know, you know that uh, an official of the king was guilty of some crime and was banished southwards. And uh, so he's there alone. So his friend is this cloud. And he talks to the cloud, saying, Take, him, uh, take my message to my wife in the Himalayas. Even as you wish to journey northwards, do zigzag along your path to linger at Ajayin and so on. So, that was the, that was the thing that he had in mind. And in fact, the cloud does do that, as was discovered by uh, uh, Sika and Gadgil, that there's a trough which moves south to north over 30 days. And this is work done by Srinivasan and Joshi uh, using space data. And uh, you can see that it's moving from here and uh, over that period of time. Um, <clears throat> well, I won't stop there too much. In nature, we see many different forms of clouds. I'll just go through them quickly. Here they are. This is done by orography, rising over the sides of a mountain. Here there are the people will recognize, Bangaloreans will recognize um, Lalbagh here. That is one of Kempegowda's towers. And on that mound, you can quite often see these clouds. Cumulus clouds elsewhere, fluffy balls sometimes, shooting plumes as in the one at the right. And sometimes when there's a hurricane, uh, rising very high, in this case, as much as 20 kilometers actually. 
Evening, well, this is a different kind of grandeur. Everything seems very peaceful and quiet, like balls of cotton, and they can be many other types. Well, clouds have been classified um, in great detail. It was a project which began uh, around 1800, uh, well, a little later, by Luke Howard, who decided, divided them into 10 genera, 10 families, if you want to put it that way, and the members of each family. And there are three which I have marked in red cumulus, which is what we are going to look at status and uh, cirrus. Fog was later on added is the 11th cloud. And um, there are catalogs now which give you pictures of each one of these. What is the problem with, uh, with clouds? Well, I consider that the major problem is actually with turbulence. Uh, most of those clouds, you see, are convective, are turbulent, turbulent convection. And uh, turbulent flow is actually a tough problem although it's very common. In principle, the equations governing turbulent flow are the same Navier-Stokes equations which we use for any viscous motion, the motion of a fluid with viscosity. But, while you can derive equations from the Navier-Stokes equations for the uh, turbulence characteristics, for example, the Reynolds shear stress or the kinetic energy in the fluctuating velocity component, uh, the equation for the mean velocity contains products of uh, higher order, um, higher order products of the fluctuation quantities, so the equations are not closed. So, the above set of equations, named after Reynolds, widely known to engineers, have to this day defied a trustworthy solution. Uh, they do do it under relatively um, easy conditions, but if you have uh, if you have separation, if you have, uh, have uh, relaminarization, uh, it's very hard to do it with these equations. So there are a variety of turbulence models that engineers have actually invented, and uh, they all make have to make assumptions which are generally not justified. The mathematical theory has been unable to handle either the Navier-Stokes equations or the Reynolds equations. The Navier-Stokes equations was first written down almost 200 years ago and they become Navier-Stokes some 160 years ago or so. But to this day, they have divided, they have defied solution. There is a prize of one million dollars for anybody who is going to uh, show how this can be done. The Clay Foundation has offered this prize for a long time, not yet awarded. Now from one point of view, if you look at it this way, turbulent fluid dynamics is one of the most difficult problems in science. It has been for 200 years and it remains that even to this day. And why is that? It really is because if you want to go to fundamentals, we don't have, we don't have the mathematics for doing it. The greatest scientists have always understood this. Uh, Feynman, for example, he called it the last unsolved problems, a problem of classical physics. He knew that it was not a solution. In fact, he used to come to the aeronautical lab there to talk to the experiments that people were doing and uh, try to see if he had an explanation. But after quite some time, and some time actually left it, thinking about this, he gave up. And in his book he writes, you know, astrophysicists can follow the evolution of a star from its birth. But a few million years later, the star explodes, but we can't figure out the reason because turbulent conviction has set in. At that point, they stop exactly the same point where the engineers stop. Okay. It is really a fundamental problem. And von Neumann, many, many famous uh, physicists have actually tried their hands at it. It's not that they have not done that. Von Neumann, actually, is a very interesting read what he writes about turbulence. And he says the impact of an adequate theory of turbulence on certain very important parts of pure mathematics may be even greater than on fluid dynamics. I mean, if you solved it, you are actually making a great contribution to pure mathematics, is, is what, what he was saying. So at bottom it's a mathematical problem and defied solution to this day. And this was a, an article which appeared in Nature about clouds. And the mystery of clouds, you see, as he says, 
He says, physicists, your planet needs you. They are trying to get new people to work on cloud physics. And <clears throat> the complex flows and uh, a central problem in the dynamics of clouds are uh, concerns how much fluid from the outside gets into the cloud and how much does the, does the fluid from within the cloud get outside. Entrainment and detrainment. These actually are at the one and the same time the consequence of the kind of flow you have within the cloud and also the uh, a mechanism which uh, is uh, tightly connected to the flow that's going on within. Uh, some, some proposals there have been made that uh, the entrainment velocity uh, VE in this, uh, in this uh, little figure here, okay, UC here is the central line velocity, VE is the entrainment velocity. And the thing that uh, works under normal conditions is to say VE proportional to UC. But that doesn't work for clouds. And it doesn't work well. A cloud like flow, this is not a cloud, but this is a laboratory experiment on, sorry, a laboratory solution of the Navier Stokes equations, direct and numerical solution. It's a steady state jet, but this is the way it looks. Um, this is just done a couple of years ago. You can see the edge of the jet here, you know, fractal actually, um, in and out. And uh, you can see the fluid coming in from outside. This fluid is rotational, vertical. Inside this is turbulent, but outside it's not turbulent. But that uh, non-turbulent, irrotational fluid flow gets sucked into these, these little lids here. And that's how the entrainment actually comes in. You can see what it's here, here, and so on. Now we've made the, the detailed study of how this happens in jets using uh, DNS so that we have all the variables we want including the vorticity, the velocity fields and so on. And um, we really can't say that in clouds with great confidence here. There are different kinds of cumulus clouds, shallow and deep, fluffy and smooth. We saw some of those pictures there, boiling, fading, blowness, crowded, chaotic and even ordered. They're all flow clouds. Can make uh, for the dynamics a closed, uh, closed circle like this. Uh, they all depend on each other. So these are all part of the problem. Uh, let's say we have, uh, let's say clouds uh, coming out here. Um, first of all, if clouds have um, water vapor, they can be phase transitions. The vapor can go to liquid, and that, because of latent heat, releases heat. We are adding heat to the flow, and that heat to the flow affects the dynamics because it's uh, convecting, affects the dynamics, cloud flow ma ma macro dynamics. Navier Stokes is enough, not enough. So you have to use the Boussinesque term, namely the gravitational force. And that, once again, is connected with thermodynamics through this uh, condensation as well as evaporation. And microphysics, there may be ice, there may be other particles, radiation from the sun. So all of those, once again, lead to these phase transitions and so on. So there's a kind of circle here. And how can we simulate this in the lab? That is the question. So we started making some experiments. And... Um, one thing which had struck me for quite some time is that uh, you have a first question you should ask, especially if you're an engineer. You know, that's a Reynolds number of 10 to the 7 or 10 to the 8, those clouds, huge, uh, 10 million maybe. How can you do it simulated in the lab? But you see, one of the funny things about free shear flows, uh, it may be a jet, it may be a mixing layer, it may be a wake. One of the, one of the very interesting things about them is that the Reynolds number effects at high Reynolds numbers are not very strong. Okay. Um, to see that um, there's no big difference, there's this comparison between, uh, well, this is a rocket thing being fired the other way, just to see how the jet goes. 
uh, near uh, JPL in Pasadena. And you can see it stretched that way. And you take that angle. And this Reynolds number is uh, 10 to the 8 here. And you take this in the lab on your desk. And you make this thing with water. Uh, with the particle spread so that you can see it. Well, that's not a very different angle. Only 10 to the 4 here, 10 to the 8 here. Four decades don't make this spread very much higher. The critical Reynolds number here yeah, is not so much from laminar to turbulent flow, but uh, a mixing transition, which is a change in the nature of the three dimensional turbulence. And that mixing transition, Reynolds number is around 10 to the 4, and uh, there are good chances that if you're beyond 10 to the 4, you're actually close to what happens. That's the reason why I think it's worth doing. Here is a simple model for the cloud. Um, that's a hot spot on the ground. Here, convection. And uh, the water vapor condenses at this condensation level. And this is the cloud we see. The cloud we see is usually has a flat bottom because that's where uh, the condensation conditions, the temperature and so on, are just right. So it condenses here, but it's actually coming from some hot spot. Of course, in, in the nature, this hot spot need not necessarily be at the same place. It may wander around and so on, as you saw in those movies. But fundamentally, this convection uh, um, fluid here with moisture comes there, and when it uh, reaches condensation level, uh, it releases heat here. So the thought in my mind when I saw this was that if that is the case, you should really put heat into a jet and see what happens. And um, uh, there are results there. This is actually what uh, Professor Bhatt did. That was his PhD thesis. And um, here, was, here was, first of all, the essay about how to put heat into the jet. And uh, what was finally discovered to be useful was uh, to put these electrodes. Uh, the water that uh, goes into, it was all done in liquid, liquids, okay, in water. Uh, once again, you can ask why water is actually taking place in, uh, <laughs> in air. But the main the thing is, uh, what, is the, what is the place where, uh, what is the arrangement where the dynamics remains the same, although the fluid may be different. And the idea was that it's easier to do it in uh, water. And so we put some colored acid here into it, so it becomes electrically conducting. And we have electrodes here with voltages applied across. So from the ohmic losses here, heat is actually being injected into the water. And we have two of those shapes here, done in the um, see. Done in, done in a tank. Well, here is a, a couple, two photographs, which I found in a kind of atlas of clouds. And these are real clouds. And you can see how close they are between the two in their shape and the kind of development that they have. You can see a large body of things uh, flat here and there too. But these shapes are similar to these ones. So it looks as if there may be something worth doing. We know what the heat release into the cloud fluid is um, in the atmosphere. It's about one watt per cubic meter. But what matters is really a measure of the heat release by an energy flux. How much, how much does the heat release contribute to the energy balance? And uh, we know what the value of uh, G is in clouds. Some estimates have been made somewhere in the range of uh, let's say 0.1 to 1. So if you can get something like that in the lab, then we should have some, some somewhat similar flows. That was the argument. So you see, you can do that in a 1 meter by, by 1 meter tank. Um, and uh, uh, the energy which you have to put in is of the order of one kilowatt. So it's very manageable. It's therefore a relatively simple thing um, in terms of doing it. So 
we make a non-dimensional heat release number. See, Q is the total heat put into the flow. U is a characteristic velocity in the jet. B is a characteristic width. G is the acceleration due to gravity. Beta is a thermal coefficient of expansion. See, this is what is responsible for the um, buoyancy force. Um, the one that, uh, yeah, that I talked about earlier. And uh, these, of course, are those which have to do with uh, the temperature uh, for non-dimensionalizing this Q. So this is what we call a heat release number. It's global. You can also make a local version of it, which depends on space and time. Uh, so with, with a function called J here, where J is actually Q per unit volume, heat put in per unit volume. So if we can get the same G in the lab as in the clouds, we must have something like what happens in clouds. Now this is the apparatus that we now have, currently built and operating at the Jawala Nehru Center. That uh, thing was done here at the Center for Atmospheric Sciences. I won't go into this in great detail, but um, this uh, had to be done because uh, we decided later on, I'll come, come to that in a short while, that you really should look, look at transient flows rather than steady state flows. So, but the, the basic heart of it is this tank uh, of water and you have uh, water coming in through the sides here. Uh, there's a plume chamber, there's some heating here and it goes through a little hole up this way. More injection, more heat is put in here, injection due to the condens uh, mimicking the condensation of the effect of condensation of water vapor. And if you want, you can put in a stratification layer here and there and you measure that temperature. And after that, you use laser instrumentation to find out what the velocity fields are like. So uh, this is another part of the setup. I won't go into that. So now, here is a comparison between the values of that parameter G uh, on the cumulus cloud 0.1 to 0.5, the low nimbus, jet plume, and 0.25 and so on. Um, this was all worked out by Ankit Krishnan about what those numbers should be. And um, so, but set up this uh, flow. The jet coming from here. Here is the beginning of the heat injection zone. That's the velocity profile there. The heat is put in here. And after that, um, this is post heating. And of course, you that's your uh, local uh, heat release parameter here. And you make sure that uh, there are the right values. So that can be done. Same values as in the clouds. Here are the way that uh, heat injection affects the flow. And you can see that uh, that width comes down at uh, high G, G of 1.8, G is actually shrunk, 3.9 would be even narrower. <clears throat> Sometimes uh, it is of interest to do this at relatively high heat injection rates. What happens to the width when you do it? Uh, this is interesting. Width is plotted versus uh, the, the height, Z. This is the heat injection zone. Now, in an ordinary jet, uh, without any heat and so on, it would grow along this line, this black line. But with the heat injection, there's a little increase in the width around here, near where you start with the heat injection. It goes on there, but eventually it levels off. It doesn't spread anymore. It's getting farther and farther out here. And sometimes the breadth may actually even come down. So you can see that as you change G, and as you get to higher values, its effects are quite strong, even on just the way at which the flow grows. And the same thing is true for the velocity, velocity, center line velocity. But what is plotted here is not the center line velocity, but for convenience, it's reciprocal. So if you see decreases, uh, 1 over uc increases, u0 over uc is non-dimensional. And you can see what happens. That is the standard jet curve without any heating. And you can see with this also, like the bit, levels off. And as, as heating increases, it levels off 
earlier and earlier. So, we know exactly how the heating may affect the shape of the cloud. Uh, oh, by the way, I should have uh, mentioned to you, the cloud we are considering is the simplest case possible. It is an axisymmetric jet or plume. So, it makes things uh, a little easier. So, um, we chose that uh, geometry. Here is the difference in width due to heating and you can see that uh, it goes like the square root of g from our measurements. So, we get a lot of these results. This is uh, very interesting actually. This is the turbulence quantity and you see the turbulence quantity um, u c prime is a fluctuating intensity maybe the root mean square value divided by the mean velocity. Uh, it keeps coming down as you normally expect in a jet as you go out. Uh, here is the heat injection zone but after you have heated it it's going, it's going up. Uh, so, u c prime sometimes actually goes up as you go beyond the heat injection zone because of the convection there. <clears throat> Which is why if you are crossing a cloud or even flying above it, you will find a lot of disturbance in an aircraft when you cross a cloud. Well, um, there are some other conclusions from that jet work, but um, it struck me later on that steady state flows are very interesting and uh, to, to study, but a cloud has a finite lifetime, life cycle. Here are some measurements made in the United States and they tell you what the life duration uh, in histogram or the distribution of uh, the life of the cloud. Now, these are in uh, minutes. So, you can see here 5 minutes, uh, 10 minutes, 10 to 15, another 5 minutes and so on. These are in 5 minute intervals as you go along as a, with time and you can see that uh, after a while the distribution becomes very small. So, the cloud lifetime uh, varies from um, uh, you know about uh, 10 minutes here, uh, 15 minutes there and uh, 40 to 45 minutes there. So, some some have may have a long, uh, long life, but most of them are around here. So, it is a transient flow in some kind. So, we started working on transient flows. Well, these had been not really um, studied enough, although some people like Turner and so on did, did talk about some of this. Here are the various um, possible analogs for a cloud. This is a, what is called a thermal, sometimes bubbles, you know a packet of flow, warm flow actually travels this way, separated from other packets. It is not a continuous flow in, in, in some sense. There is a starting plume, uh, so you start from zero and it keeps going up, it is therefore a time dependent thing. There is a steady state plume like the steady state jet we talked about, but the one we wanted to do was really this. You have a transient loop, it starts and you put heat only in this zone, in some zone, the zone that you have uh, determined and as this thing goes up, you know, you, the, the heating does not continue and eventually you have a blob here and uh, the flow and the nature of the flow may actually change. It may not actually go beyond a certain height in these uh, clouds. So, um, what is the flow like that in such things? We compare them with some real clouds and using the apparatus that I had shown, you could in fact do this with uh, heat injection and what I am trying to compare for you now here is how far you can go in actually simulating a cloud. So, uh, in this uh, range of another 6 or 10 slides, this is the 
tall, narrow, tower-like, observed cloud. Okay, it's called cumulus congestus, official name. This is the flow we can make in the tank, where, as you can see, there is a strong resemblance between this and this. Now, how do you get this resemblance? Well, the power that we put in is under our control. So, after a while, you learn what the power does. So, the power put into the flow varied like this. And, um, uh, well, there are some details about how uh, the electrode number had carried um, other quantities, the Reynolds number, and various flow conditions here. So, you can see that we can produce a cloud of the kind uh, that's called cumulus congestus. This is uh, very nearly axisymmetric for nature. So, that's one thing. Here is another one, also a cumulus congestus. And you can see that kind of striking resemblance for the shape, in part at least. And here is same thing, similar shape in another one, as you can see, between left and right. <coughs> Uh, well, one more. All of these are cumulus congestors, and they all depend on the history of the flow and what you do as you go on. Here is one which is called the cumulus mediocris. Well, mediocris, as you might guess, is not a very strong cloud. Uh, it's mediocre, so it's in fact uh, it has lost its uh, life, so to speak. Uh, no heat coming in, and it has these uh, ragged edges, and uh, it's usually slowly. Uh, disappears. Another cumulus mediocris. Fractus. Well, edges. The edges are like, well, fractal. The cloud is actually being torn. If you have any time seen a small cumulus cloud, uh, let's say before a solar eclipse, and you look at it after the total solar eclipse, you find that. Um, as the sun is getting darkened, the thing will start uh, you know, scattering out as, as if it's being torn. But once the solar eclipse, the total totality is over and you wait, they will once again collect together at around the same place. They won't look exactly the same as before, but the clouds reappear. So, and here's an accumulus fact as all these edges which are uh, hanging downstream. Well, um, okay, I won't look at this too much. So, our conclusion from these experiments, of which incidentally was a paper which appeared in, I think I showed it there, in the proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences in the US. And uh, there were many people here who were party to it. Um, the Uri was one, the Sabhat was one, and uh, well, there were others as well who all took part in it. Um, Devan Prasar, Dr. Sarup Sar Devan. So, um, well, the, the conclusion we come to is that the inter important parameters are, I think the most important is probably the heating profile history and the flow history, stratifications, and uh, the momentum and buoyancy fluxes in the flow. Um, using these quantities, you can make other length scales for it but I won't go into that. So different combinations of these can give and do give a wide variety of cumulus types, shapes, flows, uh, when, uh, particularly when wind, orography, latitude and so on are not concerned. But if you concern them, the variety will increase actually even more. Here is an entrainment coefficient. This entrainment coefficient is a non-dimensional number, which is the measure of how much of the flow outside actually gets into the cloud, gets drawn into the cloud. And if that flux is m at any given point uh, along the cloud surface or along the jet or whatever your flow in the lab is, uh, let's say m is the flux, dm dz is the rate at which that flux is varying with uh, the altitude here. Okay, And that is non-dimensionalized by this factor, 2 pi times uh, the width of the cloud and uh, the central line velocity there. The velocity scale and the width scale at z. So you divide by this by this, alpha is the coefficient, attainment coefficient. 
there was a view that uh, the entrainment coefficient remains uh, constant, certainly for, true for a jet or a plume, but once you start adding heat, it's no longer true. And uh, you can see its behavior. It starts at zero. Uh, this is the ratio of the entrainment coefficient uh, at any given uh, in any given configuration to the basic uh, the basic uh, coefficient, which is the same for all jets. So this is um, uh, measuring it, let's say, in terms of how much more or less it is compared to what would have happened in a classical plume, which is this line. So you can see um, after our first experiments, others did somewhat similar ones. Venkat Krishnan did it on a plume. Agrawal and Prasad uh, did that, I think, on a jet. And uh, there were results in Venkat Krishnan's thesis. So if you plot all of them, you can see that there's one general trend. At first, at low values from Zb, not surprising, it still behaves like a plume, same value, one. But then as the effect of the heat comes in first, it increases. And then as the heat is switched off, well, this is, this is where the heat is switched off, L. Uh, L is the height of the um, heat injection zone. So this is, uh, um, Z, Zb is the base, the height at which the base of the cloud is, so divided by the uh, height of the heat injection zone. So by the time you come here, these, in these cases, these things have fallen as you can see. In fact, they even become negative. They can even become zero, as you can see. So that seems to be the general trend in all of these. Of course, they will depend on how much heat you are putting and what particular geometry you are using. So this variation is uh, there, but that is uh, something else that has to be considered. I come to that in a few minutes. This one, however, is somewhat unusual. It's a huge value here. Comes down to very low values, negative value, and then goes up once again. But I think there were some problems with analyzing this uh, data and Saurabh Diwan and I have uh, been looking at it very closely. Maybe there is something which we will have out um, in the near future. So that is however the general character of uh, what happens. Well, um, I think I will skip this. The major point I wanted to make here is that if you take a cross section of the plume, um, you know, by using color and the laser, uh, this is the way that it will look um, in an ordinary plume, and that's the way it will look in a cloud plume, namely a, a diabatic plume. That's what we call it. Um, so you can see that here things are concentrated around the core, whereas here it's spread all over. And then you can do a wavelet analysis on it. Uh, if there is any order in the flow, the wavelet analysis is able to pick it out. In a kind of uh, Fourier series, a Fourier transform sort of thing. So when you do that, at a certain level, the raw image looks like this, but uh, the wavelet image looks like that. You see, it's ordered, actually. It is, in fact, a vortex ring. Uh, fluted vortex ring, which was actually discovered earlier with respect to those flows. And you can see that uh, if it's a simple plume, that's the structure you have. If it's a heated plume, you see this bunch of uh, fluid here with more or less the same conditions. And there, and it's known there. There's an unmixed core in many of those flows. And we see that that is discovered, that's found even in the lab. And I'll so, the conclusion from all of this was that the cumulus cloud flow is a special example of what we call a transient diabatic plume. It's transient, finite life, not steady state, diabatic because you put heat into it. Without that, it won't look quite like a cloud. Okay, we made computations. Here are the equations for a Boussinesq cloud. Well, these equations will be very familiar with you. Up there, I have a conservation of mass. It's considered incompressible. 
and here is the momentum equation with one term g alpha t which is basically due to the expansion of uh, the fluid if the temperature is positive and uh, g alpha t is basically the gravity force there due to the change in density of the fluid because of the temperature difference. And this is an equation for the temperature which depends on the amount of heat you add at j. Otherwise, it's a diffusion equation. Here is an equation on the vorticity, very important incidentally. Um, well, on the left hand side are the usual terms in the Navier Stokes equations. You have got advection from the first two terms, the omega dot del u tilts and stretches the vortices, the nu del squared omega diffuses the vortices, but the last term g cross delta t creates vortices. There is a source of vorticity once you introduce a temperature difference. And that really makes the whole flow very different and spectacular. Well, we've done various things. Our first cloud on the computer was mega one. So I'm now numbering them because now we are mega five. <laughs> and uh, this we did at that time, we didn't have the computing power required to do a spatial thing. So we did a temporal thing. On the left, you have uh, the standard uh, laboratory set up for the jet and on the right you have the z versus time axis it will grow in time not in space in z is uniform in the temporal simulation but it's a bit changes with time at any given height there it's the same at all heights so we found coherent structures like this in that flow when it was unheated and you can see that here and this again turns out to be very important there's a coherent structure here. This is vorticity. There's another one here, but this is uh, slightly tilted. A third one here below, which is uh, also slightly tilted. But uh, the best uh, shaping of the coherent structure is this. It's like a, it's like a cap, it's like a turban, so to speak. It's uh, flat at the bottom and peaked at the top. Now that's in an ordinary uh, jet. But if you put heat, this is what happens. All those structures get very highly distorted. What was, uh, it seems like such an ordered structure has here become one which is very elongated. You see. And there's the other one. There's the next one coming here. So their change, their shapes change and their entrainment characteristics also change. So it makes, uh, oh, and I, I forgot to point that out, sorry. Uh, these are contours or vorticity contours. And you can see how much the vorticity has actually gone up compared to what it was uh, before. You see? And in fact, the contours had to be changed because uh, the contours which you have after the heat addition is huge. Why? Because of that term which we had in the vorticity equation. That is really due to the baroclinic torque. I'll come to that in a moment. So, You can see how much vorticity there is, and that is shown here in the terms of the mean square value of the vorticity. Unheated, they vary with time uh, along these curves. You know, it's almost a power law. Log, uh, well, it's not quite a power law because this, 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 this axis is not log, but it drops like that. But if you heat it, it goes up like that. Now you take the difference between these two, it's about one order of magnitude. Vorticity has increased by factor something like 10, may even be more. Sometimes less, sometimes more, depending on how much heat you have put in. So there's a huge effect of that on the vorticity. Now, we have here now comparison of cloud shapes. This is no longer um, temporal. And um, we release heat here. This is how the um, Berkeley talk comes about. Um, you see, the temperature tends to be highest inside and less so on either side. So the buoyancy force is larger in the middle than on the sides. And that itself makes a little torque. In fact, that's a torque which goes like this. If this is the center of the force, the torque is doing this. Okay, and that's why you get all that entrainment. And that's also why you get all that vorticity. So, so you have those rising velocities there and uh, these rotations along the quasi-cylindrical tube, the high 
battle could not talk. And there are sinking velocities on the outside, again because of those battle could not talk. They operate in this way. Okay, this way, basically. So, that battle could not talk has a great deal to do with the flow. These are just pictures, vorticity isosurfaces um, for classical plumes. Um, and when you are heated, look at the density difference between these two. That's unheated and this is heated. So the uh, vorticity actually increases enormously. And this is the mass flow. And you can see how the mass flow changes, increases. It depends on what, uh, what velocity or vorticity contour you take. They will differ somewhat. Or whether you take uh, the velocity distribution and integrate it, then you get the smooth curve. Well, there is some rough agreement. There is a small difference between these two that is genuine. It is not, not actually an accident. If you take the full velocity profile, you will always get more, more mass flux. A part of it is actually not rotational and therefore, strictly speaking, it is not turbulent. Well, here are the different regimes in the entrainment coefficient. There are large fluctuations, but it is uh, not uh, dissimilar from the one that I showed earlier. Okay, now let's take heated plume and its heating, heating history. This is given in terms of time on the axis, height on this uh, y axis or z axis, and uh, the heat injection zone has uh, five different sub zones. And the value of g depends on the color here, and that's also shown there. So, depending on the distribution you made, I'll now run it very fast. This is how a cloud will grow. That's the way that the cloud will rise to. Started from here. The top goes out. You know, and the kind of cloud which I think you often see. Okay, what we're doing right now, and I'll take just a few minutes. I won't go into that in great detail. Here are some pictures now of uh, computed solutions. These are not measured, these are computed from those equations that I had written down. Um, the thing here, TCP is a transient classical plume, no heating. TDP is a transient diabatic plume, there is heating. And uh, these are the temperature fields. And you can see the difference here. A classical plume is growing like this. And here is the one which receives heat. And uh, the, the temperature code is here. You can see it's very hot there and it's rising, rising even more. But by the time you get to that stage, the temperature is no longer so hot, things have started cooling down. On a, transient, uh, on a transient classical plume, it keeps going there, no increase in vorticity, no increase in temperature. Now, here, this goes up to, um, okay, the heights, are, the heights are matched between these, plotted to a different scale, so that you can compare these like this. Well, they should have been somewhere about what the actual heights were here. I see that that's missing in this graph, but uh, you can see that elsewhere. This is the vorticity magnitude. Once again, that's the classical plume. Well, the vorticity doesn't change a great deal. Here, just after the heat injection zone, these uh, red blobs, you see you go to that scale 10, 20 times, red blobs appear. They now concentrate here and then they spread over a larger region. So you can see that one of the things that uh, the heating is doing is A, creating a lot of vorticity and B, therefore, increasing or enhancing the fluctuating velocities and therefore actually making more mixing that you see here, for example, compared to what is this here. I think a bit of it is, sorry, I'm sorry, it's cut out. Uh, you can see that here, how this is much more well mixed than this is. It plays a great role in mixing as well. And here are uh, azimuthly average velocities. That's one advantage with the uh, axisymmetric 
uh, thing that uh, um, you can make an azimuthal average and cut it down. And you can see how the vary once again between the transient classical plume, the blue line, and the classical, and the um, thermal transient di diabatic plume in the red. Goes up very much uh, in the second stage here at t equal to 72 for the diabatic plume. It's much higher than it was at t equal to 66, but then it already starts dropping in the next one. Here is another one which shows the temperature. Once again, you can see the big differences in the temperature between the red curves which are for the diabetic plume and the blue curves which are for the classical plume. And all of that is connected upwards and you can see that uh, there is a lot of hot fluid above the heat injection zone. Well, and uh, the same thing about vorticity, same sort of conclusion. Vorticity is sometimes huge compared to what it would be if it were a classic plume. Flow width. You can see that the flow width uh, is a little narrower in the heated case than in the unheated case, which is the blue. Here is one direct comparison we can make after looking at the literature between what has been observed on real clouds and what has been observed in the lab. And uh, well, the one on the left here. This is an atmospheric measurement uh, of a cumulus congestus. This is also a cumulus congestus. And you can see that there are three regions there uh, which the observers actually point out. This is in papers of Saunders. Uh, it's an old measurement, but some other measurements have been made. It's, it's almost as if there are three straight lines, each one describing a certain region. And the same thing happens here too in the laboratory issue. You can see that uh, the slopes of uh, these curves, um, which really has to do with the velocity and the w. And uh, you can see how they once again have one region here, one region here, and one region here. But this is the heating profile, this uh, dashed line. So we can begin to see, in fact, that's what we are now doing. What in the is known, how much of what is known in the structure of cumulus clouds can be inferred from the kind of work we are doing? I think that's time for me to close it. I'm sorry, I'm already a little late. The one about vorticity, similarly, this is at the top, and you have the head of the cloud, and you can see how the fluid is actually rushing out at the top and being sucked in at the bottom of this cauliflower like head of that uh, cloud. Well, so I want to conclude. It's a special kind of transient di diabetic plume. And uh, it's basically an source addition of heat as water vapor condenses into liquid, liquid water, which is important. Experimental simulations in the lab reproduce familiar cloud forms. The baroclinic talk plays a major role. Future. What might happen in future? Professor Matthews kept asking me. So computer simulations of clouds and moist gas, dry air plus water vapor and liquid water, they are now going on. Uh, that's why new code, Mega 5, written by Ravi Chandran, is now running. And we look forward to getting those results. Introduction of water droplets and other particles later on. And maybe in a couple of years, even uh, try to see if we can reproduce the effect of uh, uh, radiation. Well, future research, as computing power increases, um, there's reason to believe that before long, a low Reynolds number cumulus flow beyond mixing transition, R equal to 10 to 4, can be simulated on the computer. And uh, that should be more nearly realistic compared to clouds. Artificial intelligence, machine learning, and so on now are topics which are widely discussed and are being increasingly used. And it will have a big impact on the way that weather predictions are made, for example, I think, and their accuracy. 
although they may not particularly improve our fundamental understanding. Google made a forecast recently that the quantum computer will be able to do in 200 seconds what present computers would take 10 to the 4 years to do. And that could well be a revolution in the way that uh, weather and climate forecasts are made in the world. Okay, so that's about it. And here are all the people who have worked with us over the years and uh, support we have got, apart from the support of Professor Dhawan, support, this is moral support for our doing this work. When the Center of Atmospheric Sciences was uh, established and uh, some money that we have received from DST and uh, Intel. So it's come from various sources and has been responsible for this work. Thank you very much. I'm terribly sorry. I apologize for having everything. <laughs> I'd like to thank the speaker for this wonderful lecture. Uh, please, um, your special applause as I hand over this special memento. It has Professor Dhawan's image on it to the speaker. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. I just want to briefly thank Professor Narasimha for giving the lecture and for our director for chairing this session and for all of you for attending this. <laughs>